<laughs> yeah. Hello and welcome. Uh, tonight is our final uh, kitchen combo for the year. Um, yeah. I, I will be uh, looking to possibly uh, fire back up in February. Um, but until then, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Um, so we have been uh, we have been going through uh, Luke, and we've been joined uh, this fall by Pastor Janet, um, who has been educating and sharing her wisdom with us. And uh, so, uh, before we go any further, uh, why don't can you pray for our time together? Great. Gracious God, we give you thanks for this opportunity to use technology to study your word together. And so, God, we pray that you would breathe your life into the words that we read on this page. God, that you would be at the center of our conversation. And God, that you would give us wisdom and insight that by studying your word, we would come to know you better and learn to live more like the people that you have made us to be. So God, we give you thanks, and I thank you for every person who will join us. I um, just pray that you would speak to each one of us, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, so we uh, so we've been doing these kitchen combos, and uh, I haven't said it recently, but one of the one of the most meaningful parts of ministry for me are good conversations, um, and so uh, being able to have meaningful, deep conversations about life, about God, about faith. Um, about uh, about really anything, but having meaningful conversations is a huge part of what I find um, as a deep, fulfilling, and uh, a wonderful aspect of ministry. And so we have an opportunity to do that, and do that on Facebook Live. And I'm very thankful for such a wonderful Kitchen Combo partner. So thank you. Hey, you're welcome. Thank uh, you. And uh, good evening, Molly. How are you? Um, and so we uh, we've been t we've been learning a lot about Luke, a lot about this orderly account that Luke has set out for us, um, and we've had great conversations. But uh, Janet, why don't you just give us a little bit of a recap and maybe uh, talk to us a little bit what, where we're going tonight? Yeah. So we've looked at Luke not from a chapter by chapter perspective, but more from a thematic perspective. And Mitch has already mentioned one of the themes that we've consistently spoken about, which is that Luke writes an orderly account. Um, he says it himself at the very, very beginning in the first chapter that he's seeking to write an orderly account to most excellent Theophilus. Um, one of the other things that we've mentioned over and over again is that uh, Luke is writing to a universal audience both to Jews and to Gentiles, and he's seeking to communicate that Jesus came for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, we looked at some, how Luke sees an upside down world um, that Jesus has brought, ushered in an upside down world. It started right from the very beginning when Jesus is born, before he's born actually. Uh, the Magnifica, the song that Mary sings, that's where the angel visits her, um, expresses this where the, the, the lowly are lifted up and the high are brought down. And that there's many, many ways that we see that throughout the Gospel of Luke. There have been a couple of particular audiences that, that we see that with, um, the poor. Um, uh, Luke has a special place um, for the poor in this gospel, as well as for women um, who were seen as property at mm -hmm. that time and, and really didn't have very, they weren't valued in that society. Um, we spent a couple of times talking about eating mm -hmm. because not only does Jesus seem to be eating all the time, but the way in which Jesus eats reflects the gospel. And we talked about that a couple of times. And then last time we talked, um, we talked about, not last time, time before that, we talked about parables. There are some unique parables in the Gospel of Luke, the Good Samaritan, the Prodigal Son. Those are only found in Luke. They're, um, they're important ways in which we see some of these other themes. And then we talked about the death and resurrection because that is just so central mm -hmm. to each of the Gospels. And so now it kind of leaves us. We're at the end. Um, and I think there's kind of two parts to this. If we get a chance to do them both, we'll see. Mm -hmm. uh, but one is that the entire Gospel of Luke is set up as a journey. Hmm. Uh, and uh, it's really, there's so many angles that we could cut this at, but, but think about when we, the very first time, when we opened up the chapter and we started to read, and if you remember, we, we looked at it from the perspective of a drama, like imagine this is a play, mm -hmm. and it's act one, scene one, and it opens up, and the curtain comes back, and we saw Zechariah, mm -hmm. the priest, and where was Zechariah? Mm -hmm. He was in the temple, which is in Jerusalem. And so the opening scene of Luke is in the very center 
of Jerusalem, the, the central place of the Jewish faith, the power seat, if you will. And then throughout Luke, Jesus is just going back and forth between Jerusalem and, and uh, Galilee. If you, uh, again, go back to the very beginning, scene one was Zechariah in the temple, but then think about scene two, when we met Mary and the angel appears to Mary. And where is Mary? She's not in Jerusalem. She's in Podunk, Nazareth, which mm -hmm. is in Galilee. And then after Jesus is born, what happens? Jesus has to travel, mm -hmm. <laughs> or, or before he's born, to Bethlehem, which is near Jerusalem. And so there's this back and forth between Jerusalem and Galilee, kind of going back and forth. The whole gospel is set up so that um, from the very beginning until you get to chapter 9, verse 51. And, and when you get to that place, you can read it in your Bible, but it says Jesus set his face toward Jerusalem. Mm. And it's like, you know, if this is a movie, that would be where this, the, mm. the music is like, cue the, the right. kind of, yeah. um, because then from 951 until 1945-ish, um, I'd have to look at my notes to get the exact verse. Um, then that is when Jesus is in Jerusalem. It's, hey, Kathy. Hey there. Um, and so there's a very, very big chunk of the Gospel of Luke, which takes place in Jerusalem, because as we talked about last time, the death and resurrection part of the Gospel is central mm -hmm. to the story of Jesus. Yeah, and so and even though that the that Luke was written for everybody, that starting point of Jerusalem is it's interesting to think about. Absolutely. As, as uh, with when we when we think about uh, going and reaching people, mm -hmm. it's uh, it's very easy for us to think, well, let's just jump here. But even what Jesus did was he started where there were a lot of what we would call religious people. Right. 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 And started his influence and his journey in that, in that place. I think that's a very important point, Mitch, because we can jump, like you said, to um, the other. And yet what, what really all the gospels, but Luke is one we're talking about show is that God sent Jesus for all people, including the Jews. The mm -hmm. Jews are not left behind. It's not like they failed, and so now the Gentiles are being brought in. Right. Um, Jesus came first for the Jews and also for the Gentiles. Right. The other thing that's really key about that is because is that Luke wants us to see in this gospel that there is, it's called, one of the, the word that would be described is divine necessity. Mm. Uh, Luke wants us to understand that this is God's plan unfolding and it must happen. Mm -hmm. This has been the plan from the very beginning. And so starting in Jerusalem and connecting in Jerusalem connects to all of the Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah coming. Mm -hmm. And so it is evidence that God has been at work. This is not a new idea and a, a plan 57B that God has. <laughs> right, yeah. And so when we call it the biblical narrative, and yeah. so uh, if we take a look at Luke and we, we view it as a play, like you yeah. said earlier, in that, that opening scene, mm -hmm. you know, we can then, um, if, we, if we have an understanding of, of taking a look at Luke, Luke that way, then we take a step back even further and take a look at the entire Bible that way. Mm, mm, and and yeah. that opening scene creation. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And it, and I know you're going to get to it, but then we have a part in this play. But right. Maybe I'm jumping ahead. A little bit, so. <laughs> you're getting into yeah, it. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, but this, this, this idea of divine necessity um, is, is a very key idea in Luke. There is a word um, that's in Greek. It's dei, D-E-I. Um, don't confuse it with deo, which means God, like, uh, whoa. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. In Excelsis, deo. Yeah. yeah, right. So that deo is God, but dei, D-E-I, is must. And there's a number of places like, the, if, if we would read it in Greek, we would see day, 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 So day. you're saying day, it's not day? Like, Anus day? No. Day. It, yeah, it's it's different. It's oh, okay. must. Okay, all right. Um, anus, uh, that's Latin. Okay. Anus day. And so this is Greek. Oh. It's, <laughs> it's getting, <laughs> it's getting right. very confusing. Great. But the key point for us to know is that there is this, 
um, urgency, this inevitability, mm -hmm. this God is the actor behind all of this. Mm -hmm. And, and this the, is the playwright. Yes, mm -hmm. exactly. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> wonderful. Wonderful. Well, so, so the, uh, so Jesus, as you were saying, is the fulfillment of scripture. Right. Why, why would that have been important for the readers to understand that? And why is that important for us to understand that Jesus was the fulfillment of prophecies that had been made long before? I think one answer to that is what we were just talking about is that this has been God at work from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. And, and this is a, a long-term plan. Yeah. Uh, not a new plan. Um, and then the other way in which that's important is that it shows the, 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 uh, universality of the gospel mm -hmm. that that Jesus came for the Jews who were anticipating right um, the Messiah and so I, I forget the number of prophecies that Jesus did fulfill mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and someone has that number I've, I've heard it before can I, it. yeah and so but it, I, the, I think the interesting thing for me to think about is that it, it continued to affirm the legitimacy mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um the truth of mm -hmm. who jesus was mm -hmm. and is mm -hmm. um it because of these prophecies that had been fulfilled right through through the yep. coming of christ that's a good point yeah right Great. yeah so um so there's a lot of traveling going on jesus is traveling when he's in utero mm -hmm. um jesus uh the only story that we have from jesus's childhood is remember when he's in the temple and he's you know he's mary and joseph lose him and right. they find him in the temple again there's a traveling back and forth mm -hmm. from galilee to jerusalem um and uh that whole that whole uh traveling um we it, there's a word for it uh jesus is called it's a peripatetic ministry meaning he's an itinerant he mm -hmm. doesn't have a home base it's not like we you know it's very very different from our concept of ministry now um because ministry now it's like you know you have a church and you have you know mm -hmm. root yourself in the church and that's where you are but not so in luke mm -hmm. um jesus is moving his disciples are moving right it's I an have, itinerant ministry yeah, i have so many questions i, I figured I, I, well, <laughs> well i i mean maybe i won't get into it but uh too much but if that is if that was if that's the model i mean you you kind of teed me up for this but if that if uh <laughs> so i'm gonna I'm going to take the bait. And uh, if, if that was the model that Jesus kind of laid out of, a, you know, this uh, movement, uh, peripatetic. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> David says, losing your child while on a trip is still the nightmare of modern day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Even when they're 32. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, and, but so if that was the example that Jesus and that Christianity was, was built on that, um, then why don't we see that more? Yeah, that's a great question. Well, one, it's a different time okay, uh, because this is the very beginnings of Christ Christianity. Mm -hmm. And so there, there is, there's no institution, there's no tradition. Mm -hmm. um, no one knows the story. There, there is, there was a great sense of urgency mm -hmm. that they felt that I think we're missing now. Okay. So you, um, all right. Yeah. I, mean, I, I do. Yeah. I think that, you know, they had this sense that, um, that Jesus was going to come back, mm -hmm. um, very, very soon. Yeah. And so they, they were like, And and what one of the things that makes me that reminds me, and I think I've said it before, but um, and I forget who who said this. So um, may, perhaps it was C.S. Lewis, maybe Tim Keller, but uh, uh, is that um, actually? I, uh, but the that we call it the good news, the gospel mm -hmm. is the good news, and we believe that it's good. We mm -hmm. believe that that it's good, but we've we've lost sight that it's actual news. Mm. And so, so when we understand what news is, is that news is something that has to be shared, has to be communicated. Mm -hmm. And so many Christians, the gospel is not necessarily news. Yeah. At, at least we don't act like it is. Mm -hmm. we, we might say it is. Mm -hmm. um, we believe it's good because, mm -hmm. you know, hey, we, we've given our life to Christ. Mm -hmm. we, we live our life um, uh, hopefully a certain way in mm -hmm. pursuit and uh, honoring, glorifying God. Mm -hmm. 
But when it comes to this urgency that you were talking about, um, our actions don't necessarily show show that that we believe for the most part that that it's actual news. And so it needs to be news again, to your point. Yeah, I think so. I think Tim Keller said that. Yeah, was that Tim Maybe C.S. Lewis said it first, but I'm pretty sure Tim okay, Keller said it. Okay, great, yeah. But yeah, they knew it was news. I mean, nobody, it was obvious. Nobody right. knew. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, yeah. I so. like I like to, <laughs> I mean, uh, I'm not, I, hopefully don't take this the wrong way, um, but I think there's five Christian radio stations in our area. Oh my. Five, if, four, maybe five. Uh, Definitely four, um, but I but uh, to that point that there's there's a lot of, of talk about it, mm. and so I think it's easy, perhaps easy for us to assume people are hearing this. Mm. You know, mm. it's on the, like or someone else is doing it, or mm. I mean, we hear about mega churches with ten thousand people that come and like, oh well, someone else is doing it. That whole news part that might be for someone else. Yeah. Which you know what that makes me think of yeah, Mitch, okay. is um, the very end of Luke. Um, if you want, if you have a Bible with you, I want to invite you to turn to uh, chapter 24 because Luke ends the story of Jesus with two things. Uh, Jesus gives a commission and Jesus as is ascends into heaven. Mm -hmm. um, we think uh, the great commission, Matthew 28 is mm -hmm. like so Prominent. Go and make disciples all nations. Yep, right? yep. Mm -hmm. exactly. That we forget that there's commissions in the other gospels as well. It's not unique to Matthew. Mm -hmm. It's not as fleshed out in Luke. So, um, in it, uh, uh, let me find where the verse is. It's in because uh, it's very short. It's in 47. It's the last chapter, 24, uh, verse 47, and Jesus says to his disciples. You are my witnesses of these things, mm -hmm. which is, you know, in Matthew 28, you will be my witnesses. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so uh, it's, it's similar. And so and real quick, what is a witness? Right. What is a that, witness? That's my question. I, no, no, <laughs> <laughs> I'll ask you, what's a witness? Uh, and so, hey, hey Danielle. Uh, and so, yeah, so uh, witness, I think we've talked about it in previous sessions. We, may, we might have. I uh, think we did. Right. But, but, the, uh, but someone that has actually seen something and is asked to testify. That's right. Right. And yeah. so witness is someone that, that if something were to happen, that they would be required to go and testify to the thing that they've seen. So for yeah. him to say, you are my witnesses, is, right. is basically him saying, you are to go and testify right. to the miracles and to who I, that you've seen and that, uh, to who I am that yeah. you've, you've experienced, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and being a witness doesn't require a lot of creativity. It doesn't require a lot of, you know, brain power. It's just, what did you see? Right. And, and so <laughs> and it, when we talk about how your personal witness, not just yours and mine, but yours uh, is your best tool to share yeah. Christ with somebody, yeah. it's because what you're doing is that you are sharing what you have experienced, right. what God has done in your right. life. Right. And so you don't have to be creative about it. You just need to tell people what God has done. Right. Right. You exactly. don't need. You don't need to embellish. Actually, please don't embellish. <laughs> uh, you know, just yeah. say, just tell people what, what God has done, and that's all. That's that's all right. you need to do. That's right. So in in looking at this being my witnesses, I just want to point something out because the other part of tonight that I thought would be um, interesting to talk about is how Luke takes us into Acts. Um, Luke wrote both um, uh, the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts. And so look at what Acts starts with. If you look at Acts chapter 1, I'm having trouble turning my pages. Um, if you look at verse 8, chapter 1, verse 8, and verse 9, um, verse 8 says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, and after Jesus said that, then Jesus ascended. And if you look at verse nine, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight, which is exactly what also happened at the end of the gospel of Luke. He in 47 tells the, um, the, 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 in 48, that they are to be his witnesses. Mm -hmm. And then in verse 51, while he was blessing them, he withdrew from them and was carried up into the heavens. Mm -hmm. 
So Luke is ending and Acts is beginning in this, at the same time. The other thing that's significant is that Luke is ending um, in, in the Jerusalem area and Acts is beginning mm. in the Jerusalem area. Mm -hmm. Now, I'll tee you up again. <laughs> uh, yeah, great. <laughs> because what's really, I think it's really cool is that Luke starts in Jerusalem with Zechariah, goes out into Galilee, back and forth, back and forth, mm -hmm. ends in Jerusalem, mm -hmm. the seat of power for the Jewish people. Right. But the gospel has got to go out to everyone. And so Acts is where the gospel goes out. Acts starts right. in Jerusalem right. and ends in Rome, the seat of power for the Gentile world. Right. Except the, the interesting thing is that in Luke, we follow Jesus' example walking through. And then in Acts, we now, it, Jesus isn't, isn't there the way that he was right. in Luke. Right. But now it's the disciples. Right. And he says that, you know, you need to go and do this work. Right. Be my witnesses. Be my witnesses. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and uh, one of the things that I, uh, that I, I commonly um, bring up is that the people that, that we read in that, uh, about in the Bible, these disciples that go out, 11 of them were martyrs, mm -hmm. right? I mean, they, they were, they, they suffered, mm -hmm. they were killed for their faith. Mm -hmm. um, and the other was sent exiled to an island, mm -hmm. right? And so there wasn't one of them that had kind of like, oh, and one had their own church, <laughs> you know, <laughs> or one, one, uh, one really had a great life and died of natural causes. Mm -hmm. There, we don't have that. Mm -hmm. um, and that's mm -hmm. not that's not the 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 kind of the, the celebrated people of our faith. Mm -hmm. It's people that have risked a lot. Mm -hmm. And I and it's one of those questions that I, I have is that how do we live like that? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, just to be completely honest, we are so comfortable. Mm -hmm. We have so much that's been given to mm -hmm. us in and and when uh, we we have um, these conveniences and even church churches, we buy into it mm -hmm. quite frankly, mm -hmm. um, that, that we try to make, um, Christ, uh, the Christian experience for many, many people, mm -hmm. we make it as comfortable as possible mm -hmm. with the best coffee <laughs> and the easiest parking. And I'm not saying those are bad things. Those are, I love good coffee. <laughs> I really love good coffee. <laughs> However, like I want my faith to mean something. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. and and when it's too comfortable, part of me and my like insides, I'm like, I'm like, I don't think it's supposed to be like this. Mm -hmm. I feel like I feel like there's something there has to be something deeper. And maybe that's just me. But uh, but I don't know. Like, how would you respond to, to that? Um, the first thing that I think of is that if you study church history, um, it's happens over and over and over again. I mean, it's not like a trend. It's more like it always happens yeah. is that whenever the church became comfortable with society, mm -hmm. the church declined. Yeah. And so what seemed like a good thing and probably the most clearest example of this is Constantine. Um, when Constantine, you know, when, when Christian, when the church started, when we're reading in the Bible, right. um, the, like you mentioned, the, the, for the 12 disciples were, were persecuted. Right. Um, and so that, that Christians lived with constant risk of persecution in 325, Constantine was, uh, the Roman empire mm -hmm. emperor, and he declared Christianity, the legal religion of the empire. Well, then it wasn't dangerous to be a Christian right. anymore. Right. And, but that, that was the beginning of decline. Right. And that just, you know, you can just go through all these different periods in history right. in which that just kept happening. Well, even Methodism. So, I mean, we're part of first, uh, uh, Methodism really uh, was this a movement that was coming out of, of this as well. I mean, through history, um, people look at Methodism the the kind of was as this one of the big movements in Christian history. Right. So in England, where Methodism started, there was a lot of um, societal inequity, mm -hmm. and and there were impoverished people, um, and the church was kind of high society for yeah. the most part. And John Wesley just didn't. 
he, he reacted to that and, and wanted to bring faith to the, the impoverished factory workers and, and um, preached outside because they wouldn't let him preach in the church. Yeah, preaching in barns, <laughs> preaching in fields. Um, right, yeah. So it was a group they were de derided, you know, and ridiculed. Mm -hmm. um, it called Method Methodist. It was actually adopting the, 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 the teasing name that they were given, you know, like you were also methodical that they called him Methodist and they said, okay, you're going to call us Methodist. We'll call or, ourselves uh, Methodist. Yeah. You can't, you can't, yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah. that's when it thrived and it grew and it, you know, it becomes a settled, comfortable institution. Right. And it starts to decline. Right. So there's, we, we've taken a look at mainline denominations mm -hmm. in the United States and I, what, since 1970, 1976, 1970, um, two, there's been a decline in uh, mainline denominations, mm -hmm. and I, I'm willing to bet a lot of it has to do with this, mm -hmm. is that there's been this, this uh, sense of, of comfort, mm -hmm. um, and, and so it's, it, it, there's, there's a godly comfort that we know that we are taken care of, and it's mm -hmm. not that we, it's not, we're not talking about that, but what we are talking about is, uh, is when, when we become lukewarm. Yes. When our faith becomes, uh, when we expect someone else to go and do it, um, and well, the pastor will do it, mm -hmm. or the staff person. Mm -hmm. Like, it, like I, you don't need to wait around for permission from us to tell you to go and read the Bible with somebody. Mm -hmm. Please, <laughs> please, you know, you don't need to, you don't need to do that. <laughs> you don't need a credential. Yeah, Which, right. you know, is another factor that um, Alan Hirsch would say is a key factor for the decline of the mainline church has been the professionalization of clergy. Right, and I, I agree with that. I mean, and talk about comfort, if I can hit on a, um, <laughs> <laughs> this is, uh, I'm gonna poke your little end <laughs> Right. <laughs> the uh, the but uh, but talk about talking about comfort. Um, you know, part of one of the one of the things that that I I take a look at at pastors is that that if you're ordained in a in a in certain denominations, you're guaranteed appointments. And I have a I kind of have a problem with that. Um, it's not that I don't think that pastors deserve jobs. I I do. But but guaranteed appointments almost feels like uh, to me um, um, it, is that perhaps that might allow people to become too comfortable. Um, I know why they do it, and I, under, I understand the other side. And the other side of it, just to be say, just to be very, do you want to say it? Sure. Yeah, please. So yeah. Um, so just to preface that there are some very significant downsides to guaranteed appointment and if you don't know what guaranteed appointment is it's in the united methodist church if you are an ordained elder which means you have gone through a very very right. very long process right um that you are guaranteed an appointment yeah, yeah so the, the, the cabinet the bishop must appoint you uh to a church and the reason for that is that they want that how it started was that it was they wanted pastors to be able to preach the word unfettered and uh, without worrying about the repercussion of the congregation not liking what you said. Right. Yeah. And because, therefore getting right. you out of there and you lost your job. And I actually and I think that's a good that's a good thought process mm -hmm. with it because we can find um, we can uh, we can find ourselves sometimes under a lot of pressure. Um, to be speaking um, or saying something, right. um, because the congregate we know what the congregation right. wants to hear, but the gospel, quite frankly, is supposed to offend us yes. of our sins. Right. And if if we're not if if yeah. preachers are not um, are not bringing scripture and not bringing truth to the pulpit, then then. Uh, we won't be offended and it'll, you'll feel good and it'll be comfortable. So I do agree with that. And mm -hmm. so which, which side of comfort do you want to sit on? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I don't necessarily know, but it's a yeah. fascinating conversation, but, but I want to bring it down. Um, I want to bring it down to, to the congregation and, and uh, level um, just for a moment is that, is that, you know, we, we take a look here that Jesus, Jesus get, uh, walked through with Luke and has set us up for the book of Acts mm -hmm. um, for, for us to go to all the nations, right? Yep. And, and so 
um, again, we live in this North American culture, the society um, where, quite frankly, the professionalization, which to the point of we, we feel like there are experts that can do mm -hmm. this and mm -hmm. there are not experts who can't or shouldn't. And that is detrimental to the gospel. So, so my question is, how do congregants, how do we start seeing that, lay, better word, laity, how do we start seeing laity live into this reality rather than I'm going to wait for the preacher or the pastor or the staff to go and do this? Because if, that, if that's all it is, it's, it's going to be a very, very, very short uh, lifespan for Christianity. Right. So I think to answer that, I'm going to go back to the commission that Jesus gives to his disciples, which is that you are to be my witnesses. They could be his witnesses because they had walked with Jesus and they knew Jesus. They knew his teachings. They have observed his power. Mm -hmm. And so I think it starts with us as an individual any person, doesn't matter who you are, how long you've been connected to the church, right. walking with Jesus, knowing his teachings by studying scripture and observing his power by, by seeking to follow, by taking some mm. risks, having a story to tell. Mm. I think part of where we're running into problems is when it says you are to be my witnesses, we're like, I don't have anything that I've witnessed. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know, yeah, like, right. has Jesus changed your life? Are you a different person because you have walked mm. with Jesus? And if the answer is yes, you've got a story to tell. Right. You can be his, you know, it doesn't matter what it is. You know, I am a more, um, I love my spouse better. Um, I change how I use my money. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, on and on. it could be anything at all. Right. Um, but we all should have a story. Right. And we all can be a witness in that particular way. Mm. Yeah. Um, and once that starts to happen to us, that's really compelling. Right. Because all of a sudden it's like, oh my. Right. You know, like all of a sudden my home life is just so much better. Right. And so who right. doesn't want to share that story, you know, with somebody else you mm -hmm. care about, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so there, there is this ferment to that. Yeah. And it, yeah. And in, in part, like I love that word risk because, um, I, yeah, well, when I went to Blairsville, I'm like, if y'all don't know, I lived on a farm. <laughs> I, went, I went, I went from, uh, I went from playing in professional symphonies around the world to living on a farm in Blairsville, Pennsylvania. And, uh, and to be completely honest, that was my first giant risk mm. for my faith. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I, I thought I believed, mm -hmm. I, I did believe, mm -hmm. but I hadn't experienced something mm -hmm. that I could really say this, like I went there in obedience because knowing that like, like trusting the promises of what I had read. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. but to be completely honest, I like, after I had been there and started to see God work mm -hmm. and move, like, I was like, I, I, I didn't really have anything else to share. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I mean, I still mess up and mm -hmm. I, I still mm -hmm. like am a sinner and, but I can say with confidence that God is real. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I, um, I think when I'm listening to you tell that story, one of the things that strikes me is that, you know, when God kind of, tests us it almost I heard an element of test you mm. know like do you trust me will you mm. go there it's not so that God can see if we trust God it's so that we can see mm. you know like you 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 that was a risk that you took and then you knew God was real right uh, because you thought you know you took the risk and you're like yes I do believe right yeah <laughs> yeah and it's in and, and I, I mean and perhaps you know I uh perhaps in the, the, the ideal scenario, like I would have like really known. And then like, I mean, but like, if I can be completely honest, that's, that's my story. Yeah. And I don't think that we ever completely know. It's not, it's not a faith walk. If we, you know, mm. God is my, one of my favorite, it's not Luke, but um, one of my favorite scripture passages is Genesis 12. Um, when God says to Abraham, go to the land. Go God, Sarah. Amen. <laughs> 
Sarah, and I am so excited for uh, for I, uh, uh, what you had shared on Facebook about a week ago. And mm -hmm. so I just wanted to say, I'm so excited. Yeah. So in Genesis 12, God says to Abraham, go to the land I will show you. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I, I just really love that phrase. That's um, for people who like to know, to plan, to know what's ahead, mm -hmm. uh, to be confident and certain. Mm -hmm. You know, that's that's not the life of faith. Mm -hmm. You don't know you trust. Yeah, that's right. And so perhaps this is a good place to end okay. um, is that is that if you are listening and if you've kind of walked through this and perhaps you're at a place where you're thinking to yourself, um, you know, uh, I haven't felt that right. Maybe I don't know deep down. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's a risk mm -hmm. um, that maybe there's a step out in faith that you can uh, that you can experience God and and uh, and also um, I would love just to encourage more people you know not to not to wait around for the professional mm -hmm. staff or or wait around for uh, for clergy to go and and for them to do ministry and for you to receive ministry um, but rather go and minister to somebody go and listen Go and love somebody in a way that that you know that Jesus loves and God loves you. Um, that's that is the gospel, yeah. you know, yeah. and and that is what what when we talk about God inviting us into this narrative, God inviting us into this play, this grand play. That is our role to go and love as extravagantly as we possibly can. Yeah, and I think it's important in that to be witnesses. Amen. Uh, because yes. it's like a lot. There's a lot of people who do charitable, wonderful yes, things. Yes, right. Yeah. And so what's distinctive mm -hmm. about Christians is that we attribute it to the grace of God and mm -hmm. the love of Christ in us. That Amen. Compels us. Yes. So. And so as you are out there, to be clear and, yeah. and to be courageous to say, yeah, if that's a risk. Yeah, that this is this is the love that I've experienced from God Almighty. So we thank you. Yeah, we yeah. thank you so much for for joining this journey. This is our last um, last kitchen combo for until the new year. Um, and so I will be looking at starting up in February and looking to do a series of interviews with interesting people um, from around Williamsport and the surrounding area. So if you know of interesting people, <laughs> <laughs> I have a list. I sure promise. But, uh, but I'm always looking for more uh, people that you think would be great to just have a good kitchen combo. Um, uh, you can let me know. Um, is anything you'd like to share? Um, just to kind of finish this out, I mean, I think that for me, part of the, the, the number one value of Bible study, we've just gone through the whole uh, gospel of Luke. Um, but I hope at the end of this, if you've been with us multiple times, that you can say that I love scripture and I love God more because I dug in mm -hmm. and and we, we dig in so that we can have a deeper appreciation, not to pull it apart, but to understand it a little better. So that's really the goal is is to, to have a deeper love for God because you we understand more. Amen. And Sarah says go do eight, right? Oh, Abe, yes. Oh. <laughs> Sarah, <laughs> apostle, prophet, evangelist. Yeah. Je that's it. Thanks, yeah. Sarah. And and we should give a hearty, a, a large thank you to Janet uh, for uh, all of her preparation, um, all of her work uh, doing this. I, I just get to show up and ask questions. <laughs> and so I really lean heavily on uh, on your expertise in this. And I know that you're, you would not call yourself an expert. Right. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I knew you were going to say it. It's good for me to dig in. Yeah, um, so, no one ever gets as much out of something as the person who leads. Yeah, so we love you. Blessings. And Good more night. importantly, God loves you. So <laughs> take care. Bye -bye. Merry Christmas.